Our third speaker this evening is Ruth Lewin Syme, member of the chemistry faculty at Sacramento City College. Syme completed her studies in chemistry at Harvard under the Nobel laureate William N. Lipscomb, Jr. For many years, her research has provided new insights into the life and career of the physicist Lisa Meitner, who began her pioneering work on nuclear fission at the University of Berlin in the 1930s. But unlike her German colleague, Otto Hahn, did not receive the Nobel Prize for her discovery. Syme's penetrating 1996 book, Lisa Meitner, A Life in Physics, published by the University of California Press, received the 1998 Davis Prize of the History of Science Society for promoting greater public understanding of the history of science. She will speak tonight on politics, race, and gender. Lisa Meitner and the discovery of nuclear fission. We welcome with great pleasure, Rusai. <laughs> Uh, like the other speakers, I would like to thank um, the Nyes and, uh, for inviting me here. It's been really a pleasure to be in Corvallis and especially at this wonderful symposium. Uh, and now I would like to talk about Lisa Meitner and uh, some of the issues that we've been hearing will, I think, um, come through in my talk as well. In recent years, uh, Lisa Meitner has actually been brought in from the cold to some extent. Uh, historians of science now recognize her contributions to radioactivity, to nuclear physics in general, and to the discovery of nuclear fission and its theoretical interpretation, which took place in 1938. People interested in gender studies see Lisa Meitner as one of the first women to have a successful and highly visible career in German science. It was mostly in the 10s and 20s of this century. And German historians and scientists are very interested in her life for what it reveals of the history and the politics of her time. But as I said, this is rather recent, only in the last 10 or 15 years or so. For some 50 years before that, Lisa Meitner was barely visible in the history of science. The discovery of nuclear fission was attributed to her colleagues, uh, Otto Hahn, whose picture we've already seen earlier today, and Fritz Strassmann, the chemist with whom she worked in Berlin. And the Nobel Prize for the discovery went to Hahn only. In the years after World War II, Hahn was a very famous person, while Lisa Meitner faded from view. And Germans especially preferred, preferred not to examine her life or her work because it revealed so much of the history and politics of their time. I see these disparities as beginning with Lisa Meitner's forced immigration from Germany. She left in the summer of 1938, a few months before the fission discovery took place. She left illegally, and she left late, almost too late. Immigration shattered her career, and it deprived her, along with everything else, of the recognition she deserved for her part in the discovery of fission, recognition that would have been hers, as I firmly believe, by all normal standards of scientific attribution. Today, I will focus on Lisa Meitner's science, not very much of it in the time allowed, and also the politics of Nazi Germany, the politics of race, which forced her out, the politics of repression and fear, which kept her work from being recognized at the time, and finally, the politics of memory in the post-war period, which perpetuated the injustice to Lisa Meitner as a scientist and distorted the history of this discovery for many years afterwards. I will begin with the commonly accepted account of the, uh, of the discovery of nuclear fission, which many people know from various sources, in my opinion, the common, uh, commonly accepted account is not history at all, so I just call it the standard story. It goes like this, very simple. In Berlin in 1938, two chemists, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, were using neutrons to bombard uranium, which was the heaviest element known at the time. They thought they were creating new elements that were heavier than uranium, but instead they found barium, which everyone knows is much lighter. This indicated that the uranium nucleus had split, and thus we have the discovery of nuclear fission. That's it. Now, sometimes the standard story is expanded a little bit, and then Lisa Meitner and physics come in. 
The standard story may note that Meitner, who was a physicist, worked with Hahn and Strassmann, that she left Berlin before the discovery, and that she and her nephew, Otto Frisch, who was also a physicist, published the first theoretical interpretation of the physical process, of the fission process. But the standard story emphasizes that the discovery itself was a chemical discovery made by chemists at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Chemistry. And here's the clincher. The Nobel Prize was in chemistry, and it went to Otto Hahn. Over the years, the standard story has been very pervasive for a lot of reasons that are kind of obvious. First of all, fission was incredibly sensational. It was, it was and still remains one of the leading stories of the 20th century. That now in the year, coming to the close of the year 2000, uh, nuclear fission in the bomb of Hiroshima is, is, is still uh, labeled as number one. Second, because Hahn became so very famous, this is somewhat circular. Third, because the Nobel Prize was so dazzling. And undoubtedly also because journalists and historians and scientists and just a general community of casual observers thought it was only natural to assume that a woman scientist would, if anything, be at the margins. And to this day, even serious historians of science who should know better continue to cite the standard story uncritically. The funny thing is that one only needs to dig a little bit to see that the standard story is exceedingly flawed. For one thing, it places all the action in December 1938, although the scientific publications show that, an, that this was an ongoing investigation that lasted for four years, from 1934 to 1938 and that it was a team investigation that relied on physics and chemistry in a very interdisciplinary way. The publications show that analytical chemistry and radiochemistry were essential for, most, for much of the data, but that many of the measurements and much of the conceptual framework came from nuclear physics. The standard story never mentions that Lisa Meitner initiated the investigation in 1934 in Berlin, or that she was the scientific leader of the team the entire time that she was in Berlin. And it does not mention that after she escaped from Germany in the summer of 1938, that she continued to collaborate with her team through her correspondence with Otto Hahn. All these things are well documented in scientific publications and in private letters and in memoirs. Uh, and they document the fact that Lisa Meitner was part of the investigation until the discovery of barium and beyond. In the fall of 1938, she was in Stockholm, and the mail to Berlin was delivered overnight. She corresponded constantly. In November 1938, the chemist found some results that Meitner thought were very strange, and according to Strassmann, she urgently insisted, that's his words, that Hahn and Strassmann examine these results more closely. Later, Strassmann wrote, quote, she was the intellectual leader of our team, and she was still one of us. Fortunately, her opinion carried so much weight with us that we immediately began the necessary control experiments. Those were the experiments that led directly to the barium finding a few weeks later in December. Strassmann also later wrote, what difference did it make that Lisa Meitner did not participate directly in the discovery? And at the time, interestingly, Hahn also still regarded Meitner as a member of their team. When, he, when they first came upon barium, he was mystified by the finding. And he wrote to Lisa uh, close to the end of December that if she could only find some, quote, fantastic explanation, it would still, in a way, be worked by the three of us. Lisa Meitner, together with her nephew, Otto Frisch, did provide the first theoretical interpretation of the fission process. And they were also the first to calculate the energy that was released. And it was they who named the process fission, which is the term that was adopted in the English language. Their theory was itself an important discovery. And it was recognized as such by other physicists at the time. But politically, it was completely out of the question for Meitner to, be, to publish, for her name to be published together with Hahn and Strassmann. And so the two chemists published the, the barium finding in Naturwissenschaften in January 1939. And Meitner and Frisch published their theory in Nature a few weeks later. This split in the reporting divided the chemistry from the physics and the experiment from the theory, and of course, Lisa Meitner from her team. Those who did not understand the science or did not want to think about the political situation might conclude that the chemists had discovered fission while the physicists had simply interpreted it. It turns out that the Nobel committees were among those who understood very little, we're finding that out now, very little of the science or the politics. 
You may have noticed that the standard story is also politically sterile. And that is no accident, because the story is, in fact, Otto, Heron, Otto Hahn's version of the discovery, a version that he constructed just a few weeks after the discovery took place. Now, remember that this was Germany in the winter of 1938 to 39, a few weeks after Kristallnacht, a time of great uncertainty and fear. Hahn had been Lisa Meitner's closest friend and colleague for over 30 years. He was not a Nazi. He knew that her forced emigration was unjust. He knew that she had worked on the investigation from beginning to end, and he knew that she deserved to share in the discovery. But he could not insist that her name be on the Barium publication. And beyond that, he was terribly afraid that others would find out that he had continued to collaborate with her even after she had left Berlin. He openly wrote this and expressed his fear in his letters to Lisa Meitner at the time. In February 1939, just about six weeks after the discovery, he redefined the fission discovery to be just those experiments that he and Strassmann had done a few weeks earlier in December. What he wrote was this to Lisa Meitner. He says, we, we, meaning Strassmann and I, never did any physics. We only did chemical separations over and over again. Hahn was deliberately divorcing fission from physics and himself from Lisa Meitner. And in the very same letter, he told her why. He said that fission was a, quote, gift from heaven that would, he hoped, provide some political protection for himself and his institute. And in fact, it actually did, especially after Hahn and his in institute were involved in war-related research, which began just a few months later. Hahn never changed his story later on. And as I said, his version became the standard story. And in 1945, it was cemented into history by the uh, award of the Nobel Prize to him alone. And yet I believe the documentary record very plainly shows that the science was interdisciplinary from beginning to end, and that the apparent division between chemistry and physics was the result of Lisa Meitner's forced immigration and the political pressures of the time. And I have a few slides that I would like to show, if you promise not to fall asleep. Um, and uh, we, uh, that, that's great. Let me, okay, uh, here is, here is uh, Lisa Meitner at about the age of 20. Um, this is, a, <coughs> sorry, I'm just looking for the yes. This is a student picture um, uh, around 1900 at age 20. She grew up in Vienna. Getting. She grew up in Vienna to, in an intellectual family. The parents were Jewish, but she was not brought, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little feedback here. Let me try something else. Excuse me. Um, can you hear me now? Is it okay? Okay. Uh, it seems less loud than it was, sorry. Um, at any rate, uh, the Jewish religion played no role really in her upbringing and she converted as an adult to Protestantism. Uh, here we have another student picture. I'm quite sure it is a student picture because she looks so very tired. Uh, <laughs> Lisa Meitner was one of the first women to attend the University of Vienna, and she was the second to get a degree in physics. Uh, her teacher there was Ludwig Boltzmann, here, shown here. He was a great theoretical physicist and a very charismatic teacher. Excuse me. Uh, she received her doctorate in 1906. And in 1907, uh, she went to Berlin to take some courses from Max Planck, who's shown here. And he became a father figure to her, eventually a mentor, and then a very close friend. And he was the second great theoretical physicist who had a formative influence on her. She always stayed close to theory, but she herself was an experimentalist. And shortly after she came to Berlin, she began working with a young man, uh, Otto Hahn, who was almost exactly her age and a chemist. And I want to emphasize that at that time, that was the only way for a woman to work uh, in research in a laboratory was to find a man who was willing to work with her. In this case, she was very fortunate. Uh, Han was a chemist. She was a physicist. And she could ma maintain her intellectual independence that way. And personally, they were also very good together, very well suited to, for each other. She was very shy and reserved. And he was, he was very sociable. Um, you can see she did a lot of the work and he posed for pictures. Um, but uh, 
I'm not saying that was typical. Uh, but in, this, in these early years in Berlin, Lisa Meitner had no position whatsoever and absolutely no pay. She lived on a small allowance from her parents. But she was very much at home at, in Berlin, and she stayed for 31 years. Uh, here she is on a hike. The, the, um, the young woman on the right uh, is one of um, Max Planck's daughters. So she had a very good social uh, life. We don't know if there was ever a romance between Lisa Meitner and Otto Hahn. People have looked for it. There's no evidence, so we have to assume that there was not. Um, but their collaboration was very productive. And in 1912, they moved to the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of, for Chemistry, uh, which in a western suburb of Berlin. And here it is shown here before when the first trees were planted and before the roads were even in. This was a, a tremendous uh, step up because Hahn was made a professor. And soon after that, Lisa Meitner also was given a position, basically her first paid position. Here are Meitner and Hahn in their new laboratory at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. And here again, um, in approximately 1918, shortly after they discovered the element productinium, which is element 91. Uh, this was more or less the end of their work together, their initial work together in radioactivity. At this point, radioactivity more or less evolved into nuclear physics. And after World War I, Lisa Meitner was given her own section in the Institute. She was given the title of professor. She was essentially the equal of Hahn at this point in, in terms of career. And she went into the field of nuclear physics uh, and became really one of the pioneers in nuclear physics in the 1920s. And the work was independent of Hahn, who stayed in radiochemistry. And you, you can see that this was particularly important, especially for a woman, to establish herself independently of a male collaborator. And in the next few pictures, I just want to indicate Lisa Meitner's circle in Berlin. Uh, the, her colleagues included uh, people, well, here is Hahn, of course. Here is James Frank. Here is Einstein, also in Berlin, uh, very much uh, in the same circle uh, of people. And here, a very famous picture, Niels Bohr's first visit to Berlin in, in 1920. Uh, here is, again, James Frank. Here is Otto Stern. Lisa Meitner, of course, almost always uh, one of the only women. Uh, here, of course, is Han, uh, Hans Geiger of the Geiger-Miller counter, and, and a number of other um, very, very well-known, or eventually very well-known scientists who were basically um, her, her closest colleagues. And again, uh, in around 1930, Lisa Meitner was rather small. Ernest Rutherford was very large. Uh, and we have here again Hans Geiger. This is his wife. And uh, James Chadwick. This was shortly before Chadwick um, discovered the neutron. This picture it, uh, was taken when Lisa Meitner was approximately 50, around 1930. She smoked, and she worked in radioactivity, and she lived to the age of 90. <laughs> when dare, almost dare not say this in Corbellus. Um, after Hitler came to, to power in 1933, Lisa Meitner was not dismissed for a number of reasons, but probably primarily, primar one, because she was very prominent. Second, because the Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes were not at that time, immediately under the control of the government, but primarily probably because she had retained her Austrian citizenship and the, <clears throat> many of the, uh, the, uh, the rules uh, which had led to the dismissal of so many academics, as Uta Deichmann has, has mentioned, did not immediately apply to her. And so she stayed, as many Jews did who could stay, hoping that things were improve, would improve. And, to some extent, not being willing to take the uh, to take a job away from another Jewish emigre by uh, by going into the immigration herself, and in 1934 she began the investigation that led to the discovery of nuclear fission. First, she recruited Hahn, and then also here is Fritz Strassmann, a younger chemist. Uh, this was taken at about that time in the early 1930s. Unlike Hahn, uh, Strassmann was actually personally courageous in a political sense. He and his wife hid a Jewish friend in their home, and this was when they had a very young child, extremely dangerous, uh, during the war. The friend survived, and Strassmann is remembered with a tree planted in his name at Yad Vashem, the Israeli Holocaust Memorial. 
Th this photograph was taken shortly before Lisa Meitner escaped from Germany in the summer of 1938. Shortly after she left Germany, about uh, four, months, four or five months after, Hahn and Strassmann identified Barium and informed Lisa Meitner by mail. This was just around Christmas time of 1938, and Lisa Meitner met her nephew, Otto Frisch, who's shown here, who was also a refugee from Germany, and he was working in Copenhagen. They met uh, in, in the west coast of Sweden for Christmas, and together they thought about the discovery of barium, and together came up with the first theoretical interpretation of the fission process. During the war, both sides had projects for developing uh, nuclear weapons uh, and atomic energy. Here is the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Chemistry after the Allied air raids in February of 1944. At a, shortly after these raids, which really demolished the institute, actually the institute is this building here, and this in the foreground was the place where Lisa Meitner used to live in one of the apartments in this smaller building. Uh, shortly after, uh, much of Berlin and, and this institute was, uh, was ruined, uh, the, the various institutes that were involved in the fission project were moved to southern Germany and Hahn along with them. From Sweden, Lisa Meitner was asked to join the Allies in Los Alamos at some point during the war around 1941 or 42, but she refused. One of the reasons that Lisa Meitner never disappeared entirely from view was that after the war, she was very briefly uh, a celebrity, especially in the United States. In 1946, she was invited to the United States, and she was the center of a tremendous amount of media attention. It was really a false ce celebrity. She was more or less called the, quote, Jewish mother of the atomic bomb, and uh, which was wrong on almost every count. Uh, <laughs> And uh, eventually, the celebrity uh, faded. But it, it does account for her still being present in certain presentations and textbooks where it, uh, she, it, it really did help preserve her name. Or she might have really faded entirely from view much sooner. And of course, here she is with President Harry Truman. This was in the spring of 1946. Here she is in 1949 at age 70, giving a lecture on nuclear physics. She continued to work until she was almost 80. Uh, in 1960, she, um, she moved to Cambridge, England from, from Sweden. Uh, she was never particularly happy in Sweden, and she moved to Cambridge at the age of 82 to be near uh, her nephew Otto Frisch and his family. And she died in 1968. Uh, the, the inscription, which was, um, which was thought up by Otto Frisch, refers in part to her refusal uh, to work on the bomb. What we have here uh, is a museum display from the Deutsches Museum, uh, which is a science museum in Munich. And this really is how the discovery of fission was represented in the post-war period, primarily in Germany, but also elsewhere. Um, this, this display was uh, in this form from about 1955 to about 1990. It shows some of the instruments that were used in the fission discovery. Uh, what we have here are, uh, here are some neutron sources. Here's a paraffin block for slowing the neutrons. There's various little lead. You can see this is very low tech. Uh, there's various little lead uh, containers for the radioactive materials and Geiger-Muller tubes and various counting devices. And this is the power supply down here, which is a bank of batteries, all on a plain wooden table. Um, you will notice, of course, um, that uh, it says right above the table that it obviously shows that Otto Hahn gets star billing. This is the work table of Otto Hahn. Above is another uh, large sign with, with a large lettered sign with Otto Hahn's name. And he gets, is, is, says together with F. Strassmann, they don't even give Strassmann's first name, uh, that they discovered nuclear fission to, uh, in uh, 1938. For 35 years, this display stood in the Deutsches Museum in Munich, and Lisa Meitner's name was entirely absent. Uh, and yet, if you look at it, you'll see that this display is, of course, the physical apparatus that Lisa Meitner built and assembled on a table in her laboratory in her section of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. And in fact, the only chemical thing that's on this table is this little glass flask, which you practically can't see. And that was just to indicate that chemistry had something to do with it. But, um, 
but the written and audio texts, perfect, uh, actually there's also an audio text with Han narrating uh, his version of the story and, and saying what this is all about. The written and the audio texts perfectly illustrate here Han's standard story. But if, you want to, if people wanted to look at it, they could see that the physics equipment is right out there for anyone who really wants to recognize that physics and possibly Lisa Meitner had something to do with this. I was not the first person to notice this, of course. The Deutsches Museum received a number of complaints, mostly from women, over the years. And in the late 1980s, the museum tacked a real small sign on the wall way off to the right, about there. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it noted that Lisa Meitner had worked with Hahn and Strassmann as the Mitarbeiterin. Now, it's a German word that translates as co-worker, but it, as in English, it means a subordinate co-worker. So she was the Mitarbeiterin of Otto Hahn. Now, if we look at this, of course, the gender, the gender bias is a given. The woman scientist is invisible first, then she's peripheral and subordinate. Beyond that, the muse museum display is not so much history, in my opinion, as it is advertising. Uh, it promotes the standard story and Otto Hahn. And the reason it does so is because Hahn was a hugely famous pub public figure during this period. He was really a scientific icon. As uh, Ute Deichmann has noted, he was president of the Max Planck Gesellschaft, which made him really the leader of German science. And also, of course, uh, since he was the discoverer of nuclear fission, he was just a sensation in post-war Germany. He had what you could say is exactly the right stuff for what post-war Germany needed at the time. Most sensational discovery of the time. Here's Hahn, he's the Nobel laureate, he's the decent German who was never a Nazi, and he's the pure scientist who in many declarations said that he wanted his discovery of nuclear fission to be used only for peaceful purposes. So with all this, he was granted to a remarkable extent the historical license to construct his own history of the discovery without critical uh, judgment uh, uh, almost at all. And he did do this. He wrote two autobiographies. There were countless articles by him and about him. There's no end of biographical material. And there's endless interviews with uncritical me media attention. And this lasted for over, 25, for over 20 years. With respect to Lisa Meitner, however, Hahn never changed his story, except ultimately to make it stronger. I'm going to interrupt the slides for a moment and come back later to a couple more. Now we know from their correspondence that Meitner expected Hahn to make some effort to correct the record after the war. And she was shocked, really, and disappointed when he did not. When she wrote to friends in 1946, she, she saw it in part as, as personal failings on his part. She wrote that he does not have a strong character, I'm quoting, nor is he capable of thinking clearly. She regarded it as a kind of self-deception on his part and possibly opportunism. But she also realized that the issue was political. And she wrote to another friend, he absolutely suppresses the Nazi crimes and is thereby led to very wrong conclusions. This was in 1947. Then she wrote again, Han suppresses the past with all his might, and I am part of that suppressed past. Now, the suppression of the past is a recurrent theme in the immediate uh, history of post-war Germany. Primo Levi has written that the history of the Third Reich can be interpreted as, quote, a war against memory, a falsification of memory, a falsification of reality. And we can see from this example that the falsification of memory and reality did not end with the end of the Third Reich. And we've seen this also from the examples from the previous two speakers. Obviously, the issues here are difficult. We can sense, on the one hand, that, Germans were, that these Germans were burdened by their past. And therefore, in a way, we can understand why they would want to deny it and turn away from it. One certainly can argue that it was useful for them, perhaps even necessary to do this, in order for them to rebuild without a generation of finger pointing and re recriminations. But on another level, one reacts to this with considerable revulsion. It is not really a question of collective guilt that we're talking about here, but rather of, of individuals taking responsibility for whatever they did or failed to do as individuals at a time of violence and injustice. 
And in that sense, it is really wrenching to see that even good Germans, decent Germans like Hahn, seem to have had almost no reaction to what happened. They did not seem to be horrified. They did not seem to feel any loss. Instead, what they did was they molded their memory as a convenience to benefit themselves, not recognizing, I think, to what extent this actually implicated them in what they were trying to forget and deny. And what this did, actually, in the immediate post-war period was to create a psychological gulf between them and non-Germans, as Uta Dijkman has noted, and also between themselves and the next generation of Germans. And I think Uta would agree with me on that as well. Historically, the void was also very great, and the standard story is only one example. I think one reason that the standard story lasted as long as it did, of course, is partly the Nobel Prize, which gave sort of the imprimatur of the scientific community to the standard story. And it, it's the whole issue of the, of the Nobel Prize as a, distor a, a stor distorting influence in science history in this, uh, in this century is, I think, a very real one. But I don't have time for that today. But another reason that the standard story lasted so long is that it was incorporated as into a larger legend, which has become to be known as the myth of the German atomic bomb. The myth began precisely at the end of World War II with a group of prominent German atomic scientists who were interned by the British at Farm Hall, an estate near Cambridge, in 1945, uh, just at the end of the uh, war uh, in Europe. There were 10 scientists altogether, and Otto Hahn was one of them. They had all worked on the German fission project, but with little result. There was no bomb, of course, and there was e not even a critical reactor. And so the news of Hiroshima came to them as a huge surprise and a staggering professional blow. As Germans, they were already defeated and tainted. Now they were scientific failures as well. On the night of Hiroshima, August 6, 1945, the physicist Karl Friedrich von Weizsäcker said, and I quote, if we had wanted Germany to win the war, we would have succeeded. And the next day he said, quote, History will record that the peaceful development of nuclear energy was made in Germany under the Hitler regime, while the Americans and the English developed this ghastly weapon of war. Well, Weizsäcker, of course, was very wrong about, Hitler's judge, about history's judgment, of course, but his statements had appealed to his colleagues because now the Americans were the mass murderers and the German slate, at least with respect to nuclear weapons, was wiped clean. The next day, on August 8th, the day before Nagasaki, the next day, the scientists prepared a press release which described their wor war work as nuclear research for peaceful purposes. Uh, and uh, the, the research that has gone into this shows that this was more than stretching the truth. But in a separate statement, Hahn noted that Lisa Meitner had left Germany long before fission was discovered and that she did not participate in the discovery. And he added, Quote, as long as Professor Meitner was in Germany, the fission of uranium was considered impossible. And of course, he implied with this that she had done nothing for the discovery except to prevent it from happening sooner. The myth of German scientists whose work under the Nazis was scientifically successful and morally uncompromised would be hotly debated after the war. There's a huge literature that has gone into this. And it is actually still being debated because it is, un, in, in many senses, unresolvable. But in some ways, the myth was highly successful because it defined the image of the atomic scientist in post-war Germany in a very positive way. Certainly, the claim of the myth for German excellence in pure science was hardly challenged. And for this, Hahn was absolutely invaluable, for his politics were above reproach, and no one could deny that the discovery of fission was purely scientific. But for the myth to have maximum effect, however, the discovery also had to be purely German. And including Lisa Meitner in the discovery would have spoiled the story. And so the standard story in its original form was an essential part of the myth's success. From that time on, Hahn, and his colleagues in Farm Hall, and eventually their students and other followers would promote the standard story, always asserting ever more emphatically 
that physics and Lisa Meitner had nothing to do with the discovery of fission, that she had obstructed the discovery, that it was made by the chemists in spite of the physicists, I'm quoting. And this sort of thing is not over. A documented history of nuclear fission that includes Lisa Meitner, my biography and others, uh, it, my biography in particular, was dismissed, for example, as a work of defamation against Otto Hahn. And on the other hand, this was a, a year ago or so. On the other hand, Carl Friedrich von Weizsäcker, who's still alive, very elderly, but still very prominent, and more or less in command of his faculties, he doesn't uh, miss a chance to retell the standard story, and he rejects any challenge to it as, quote, absurd. So clearly what we, are ha what we have here, 50 years later, 60 years after the discovery, and 50, more than 50 years after the end of the war, what we have here still are competing narratives. I really do not think that the standard story will ever be fully dislodged or displaced. I don't think that's possible for something that has gone into the literature to that extent, and certainly not in Germany. But nevertheless, a history that includes Lisa Meitner and physics and represents the discovery of fission in, in, in a more complete way is being heard and seen. And let's see. There we go. This is the Deutsches Museum display as of 1991. The table is the same. The equipment is more or less the same. Uh, they've rearranged it slightly. But uh, the rest of it, the, the written and the audio texts have been revised to include Lisa Meitner, uh, al along with Hahn and Strassmann, much more equitably. Uh, the text is much more complete, and it is more historically uh, representative. And finally, here, we have uh, a more or less up-to-date periodic table. And um, I'm looking for my pointer. There it is. And I would like to point out some of the newer um, synthetic elements here as we go on up. You'll notice that element 109 MT has been named for Lisa Meitner, and this name has been approved. Uh, the element was synthesized by a group of scientists in Darmstadt, Germany, at the Society for Heavy Ion Research. And they have been synthesizing a, a good number of the heavy elements in this region over here. 